you may be seated. As you're doing so, look over at somebody and let them know you are in the right place at the right time on a Wednesday night. Does anybody else just like really like Wednesday night church? Amen. I, uh, I really, really like Wednesday nights. Seems like Wednesday nights are a moment where people who just really want to be in the house of God decide to hang out together. And, uh, you know, something happens when we don't gather in the name of a church or we don't gather in the name of a preacher, but we actually gather in the name of Jesus. Jesus shows up. And in that moment, anything is possible. And I believe that that is the atmosphere in the case for tonight. Um, I've heard so much about your church and heard so much about you. And man, what an honor to be able to experience it firsthand. Um, we have, uh, we've greatly enjoyed ourselves in Mississippi. I am truly from the middle of nowhere, Kentucky. Uh, we live uh, two hours from everything. We're two hours from Nashville. We're two hours from Louisville. We're two hours from Lexington. We're two hours from Knoxville. Uh, and uh, up until just recently, my wife and I, we live 30 minutes from the nearest stoplight. We don't know what Starbucks is, at least the majority of our population. Um, and we drive about 30 minutes to the nearest Walmart. Um, so we have a heart for rural Kentucky. Uh, we feel like that the mandate on our life is to reach every hometown in Kentucky. Um, and we're in, in, uh, in the process of doing our best to do that. Um, I, I tell people the only drug problem I ever had is that my parents drugged me to church whether I wanted to go or not. And uh, matter of fact, my parents brought me home from the hospital. The first place they ever took me was to church. And uh, at the age of seven, um, I had an experience with God. Uh, that, that, that I just became aware I was a sinner and I needed a Savior. And I remember going to an altar and, and, and weeping in repentance before the Lord. At the age of 12, I was sitting in Sister Eva Ray's class. The room disappeared, and I realized someday I was supposed to preach the gospel. I consciously ran from that call the next six years of my life. But at the age of 18, while uh, commuting back and forth to college, pursuing an engineering degree, I pulled a car over, mile marker 82 on the Cumberland Parkway, and I had a Damascus Road experience. Two weeks later, I preached my very first message. From that time until now, I have stood in a pulpit over 7,000 times. And uh, I am uh, I share that just simply to say I'm not looking for a place to preach. Um, I'm not here to impress you. Um, and I'm not a real big fan of longhorn sermons. Two good points and a whole lot of bull in between. Um, <laughs> I believe in getting to the point. Can I get a witness from somebody? So uh, I want you to join me in 2 Kings chapter 4. Uh, I'm going to read several verses. Some of you will read more Bible tonight than you've read all year. That's okay. Uh, we're going to catch you up, all right? That was meant to be a joke. I'm starting to think maybe you thought it was true. I'm not, um, as you're turning there, I do want to say, I'll read from the New King James Version. Uh, I do want to say, man, what an honor to have my wife with me. Uh, she is the best thing that ever happened to me. God used her to give me the two greatest gifts that I've ever been given, and that is my daughter, Natalie Grace, who's a budding entrepreneur at 16. Uh, she already runs three businesses, and my son, uh, 14, who is quite the uh, basketball player. Matter of fact, we will leave here, meet him in Nashville, and he's going to Houston to be evaluated uh, by different colleges and different stuff like that. So um, we're, uh, we're, we're really thankful for the family that God's given us, but we're also really thankful for the friends that he's given us. And the Boggs family, yeah, they're just great friends. And uh, we love them so much. You have been, you have been blessed with a gift. Um, you, you really have. Um, I think he, Pastor Ethan told me today, 31. He's much older than 31. Don't, don't let his looks or uh, his young face confuse you. He is old in the spirit. Uh, it's fun to hang out around some people who are old in the spirit. And God's grown them up quick and spiritually matured them. And um, I, I love Pastor Ethan and, 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 and Miss Lena and the family that God's given them. They are the real deal. They are authentic. They really do desire to have the touch of God on their life. They seek counsel. They seek wisdom. And they prove themselves teachable because they actually apply it after you tell it to them. I'm 41 years old, but I'm too old to waste my breath on an unteachable spirit. And, uh, 
And I, I can tell you that he has proven himself teachable over and over again. And I'm really, really grateful for what God's given Columbus, Mississippi. Come on, let God one more time know how much you appreciate him. Amen. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 15. And so he said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the doorway. Just tell somebody, she stood in the doorway. Now the person you ignored, just turn and tell them, she stood in the doorway. And then he said, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. But the woman conceived and bore a son when the appointed time had come, of which Elisha had told her. And the child grew. And now it happened one day that when he went out to his father, to the reapers, to the harvest field, that he said to his father, my head, my head. And so he said to a servant, carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees until noon. He, he, he was laid in her lap, but then he died. And so she went up and she laid him on the bed of the man of God and she shut the door and she went out. And then she called to her husband and said, get me some young men and some donkeys. We got to go to the man of God. Verse 32 and when Elijah came into the house, there was the child lying dead on the bed. He went in, therefore shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. And he went up, he lay on the child, he put his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, his hands on his hands, and he stretched himself out on the child. And the flesh of the child became warm. And the flesh of the child became warm. Just look over at somebody and tell them things are heating up. Father, help me to preach, help me to teach. Give me an anointing for such a time as this. Let there be a special grace. Show me where to pierce, show me where to heal. Bind every spirit but the Holy Spirit, God, that would be against anything you would desire to do and loose our spirits, teal our hearts, God, to receive your word. May it bring great harvest in our lives, Lord. Let it be done in Jesus' name. And this church said, amen, amen and amen. Um, in 2012... Um, I was sitting in a meeting and um, something happened inside my body. I want to tell you about that. But the first thing I need to ask you is this. Have you ever had God ring your doorbell? Have you ever had God ring your doorbell? He did, after all, say, behold, I stand at the door and knock. 2012, I'm sitting in a meeting. We're conducting some business on behalf of the church and something came apart on the inside of my gut. Uh, little did I know that when they took me out of the office that day that uh, the impending result was going to be uh, five surgeries over the next two and a half years. Uh, during that time frame, I would lose about 90 pounds. My wife likes to jokingly say that she married the linebacker and she spent two and a half years sleeping with the field goal kicker. <laughs> it was during that time of being really sick, and I couldn't get a breakthrough. Uh, at one point, I was with what they described as the, the best colorectal surgeon east of the Mississippi River, unable to fix my issue. Then I found myself at Mayo Clinic with what was described as the best colorectal surgeon west of the Mississippi River. In multiple attempts, unable to solve my problem. In, in the process of this journey, something crazy happened. My health insurance got canceled. Um, you get ready for this. They, they said I couldn't validate my U.S. citizenship. I asked one of those ladies over the phone, are you listening to me talk? Do you know how far back in the woods you got to be from to have this kind of vernacular? <laughs> I tried to fax it. I tried to email it. I tried to upload it and scan it. Nothing worked. They were, so they canceled our, my health insurance. Um, I was left with tens of thousands of dollars in medical bills. And it was right about here that I started to, to really get confused because I didn't understand why God was allowing what I was going through. And it resulted in my wife and I actually going for a drive uh, down to a, a state park in Kentucky. And 
we just went down and sat by the water's edge and we tried to talk through it. And I'm like, Mandy, I don't understand this. Like, I believe in tithing. I believe in honoring God. First check I ever wrote was to my local church to pay tithe on the calf that I just sold at the stockyard. And from that time until the time forward, I had never failed to put God first in my finances. And now here I was with my finances completely devoured. I thought he said that if you would put him first in that capacity, that he would rebuke the devourer. And now not only are our finances devoured, but my body is devoured. I'm nothing but skin and bones and they can't find a fix. And I remember sitting there in that state park saying out loud, I don't even know if I believe in this anymore. I made my way back to the truck and no sooner than I had gotten into the vehicle and started the engine and started out of that park, the phone rang and it was once again Mayo Clinic and they were calling to inform me that I owed $13,000 more that they had not yet made me aware of. And I got so mad that I threw the phone. And when I went home that evening, um, I wasn't a real fun person to be around. And I remember the house was dark and I had pulled the shades and I was just kind of sitting there just like, God, what is going on? Like, I don't understand. Like, your word is failing in my life. And about that time, the doorbell rang. And I thought, the audacity of church people. <laughs> like, I'm, here I am having a spiritual meltdown, and, and they won't even leave me alone. Like, what do they want? They want me to come out on the sidewalk and pray with somebody? Am I supposed to counsel somebody? Am I, they need me to go do a hospital visit? Like, I don't want to be bothered right now. And, and it rang again. And I waited for Mandy to get it. And it rang again. And finally, I got up and I made my way to the door in response to this doorbell, really with a rebuke in my heart. And I opened the door to discover it was a man from my church. And he said, do you mind if I come in for a minute? Yeah, actually, I do. <laughs> well, I, I, it won't take but just a moment. If, if, can I come in? And, and standing in my doorway... He extends an envelope to me. And he says, I just want you to understand that there are some men in our church that are aware of your situation. And God has put it on our heart to let you know that he sees you. And he hands me the envelope. And I, I remember after he exited my house, I, I, I walked over to the, the kitchen bar that we had, the kind of a countertop. And, and, I, and I just looked at the envelope for a second. And, and I, I felt this overwhelming sense of God's presence. And I'll never forget that as I opened the envelope and, and made my way towards what was inside, I discovered a check that was for more than enough than every single penny I owed for medical bills. And I remember falling to my face and beginning to thank God for the fact that he's still God all by himself. And I began to repent for every moment that I doubted him and for every moment that I didn't trust him and for every moment that I didn't believe that he would come through for me and that he was still the God who would rebuke the devourer and open up windows of heaven and pour out blessings upon you that you don't even have room enough to contain. But so many times I have thought, what if I had not responded to the doorway? Like, what if I had have ignored the doorbell? And, and, and what I see happening in 2 Kings is that there is a woman that is inside her home and some, something has been happening in her community regarding a move of God. There is a, a move of God taking place and she starts to make room for that move of God in her own home. Uh, what she does is she actually builds a room onto her house because in that day there were not hotels. There was no Airbnb. There wasn't a place for the men of God to stay. And so she constructs a place onto her home so that the, the move of God, when it's passing through her community, it'll have a place to be housed. 
And what she didn't even recognize is that when she was making room for the move of God in her house, God was paying attention to the desires of her heart. And the direct result of the intentionality in her home is that God was about to put out a call and he was about to announce, I need you to come to the doorway. I'm about to ring your doorbell. I need you to reposition yourself in the doorway. And so that's exactly what happens. This, this room has been constructed. This space for the move of God has been built. And, and, and the call comes in. Come to the doorway. Stand in the doorway. And I really feel an unction of the Holy Spirit tonight to tell some of you that God sees exactly what's been going on in your house. And He understands that you've been intentional about making room for the move of His presence. That there has been an intentionality in your life of making sure that there is space for what God is doing in this community. And I believe that there's a call about to come in from heaven through the prophetic mouthpiece that decrees it's time to come to the doorway. And if you will be willing to position yourself in the doorway, what this woman found out is that God was about to deposit something in her that she didn't even know he was capable of doing through her. Up to this point, this woman just thought that she was barren. This woman thought that she would never be able to have children. This woman had never been able to see her own dreams come to fruition. But because she was willing to put herself in the doorway, the word comes to her life. God's about to deposit a seed in your womb. And that seed is going to come to fruition and that that seed is going to give birth and you're going to birth a promise of God. It's it's unique because she didn't even ask for it. God, God just saw everything that she was doing with intentionality. Everything that she was doing to create space, everything that she was doing to make room, everything that she was doing to align herself, sync herself with the move of God in her community. And God said, I'm going to give you the desires of your heart. And so he, he speaks this in, into her life and, and she, she, she finds out she's going to have a child and she gives birth to this child. And, and then this is where things get crazy because... This is a word for some of you beyond even what I just spoke. I do believe there will be those of you that tonight God will call to the doorway, that God has even been calling to the doorway, and that there's a word that he wants to release in you, and there's something that he wants to deposit in you. But 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 some of you have already been in the doorway, and some of you have already had God deposit something in you, and some of you have already had moments where that you knew that there was a promise that was coming to fruition. And that's the next part of the story, because she gets the promise, the promise is birthed, and then the promise dies. It, it, it dies. It, here's how it died. The, the, the promise, the child, is sent out into the father's field to work. And the, fa- the, the, the son is, is working with the father. He's, he's working in the field. And and evidently it was a hot day. Uh, evidently it was a day that it just even the climate was bringing a, a lot of pressure to the situation because as they're working with the reapers and they're trying to bring in the harvest field, what happens is that it says this boy starts to cry out, my head, my head. We don't know if it was a heat stroke or if it was a sun stroke or if something has broken in, in his, 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 his body, but... It's, it's directly connected to his head, my head, my head. I'm telling you, if you've lived through this pandemic and you've had very much responsibility, I'll guarantee you at some point you have said, my head, my head. So concerned about making the right decision, feeling all the pressure of you could make the wrong decision, waiting for everybody looking, waiting for you to mess up and just my head, my head. And this boy collapses in the harvest field, my head, my head, and, and, and it's what they do next that is unique because as he's decreeing my head, my head, they take him back to his mama and, and they lay him on his mama's lap. Uh, and he stays there for an extended period of time. And really what that is is a, a, a sign and a symbol of returning to the place of his origin. His head is, is laid in his mother's lap. It's the place of origin but, but, but he still dies. 
And the response that she has is that she now takes him to this place that's been constructed in her home. This this place that's been synced up with the move of God in her community. She takes him there. I want to tell you something. It's really good to have history with God when something goes wrong. And she, she takes him to this place that signifies her testimony, this place that signifies stuff that God has done in the past. She places him in the room. And, and, and the Bible says that she shuts the door on him. <laughs> and that's a unique thing because sometimes you just got to shut the door on some things. You, you got to shut the door. Am I, do I have to preach this out for you? Because I know some of you are living this already. Sometimes you got to shut the door on some people's Facebook feed. You got to shut the door on some folks' Twitter feed, and you got to shut the door on some people's text. Because sometimes you just, you know, you're going through. You know, you're going through. Shut the door. And she she makes a, a statement. She says, "I need something." I don't care if it isn't anything but a donkey, but get me something because I got to go get the man of God. I, I, I got to align myself with the word of God. I've got to align myself with the prophetic unction that's over this house and, and over my life and over this promise. And, and what happens in this moment is that, do, do, do you realize what's happening? The, the boy died and, and they bring him back to the place of his origin, which then takes him to the place that represents making room for God. And then the call is made for the man of God. She's retracing her steps. If you have ever lost anything with God, you will discover that you will have to retrace your steps to at least two places. Number one, the place where that you last made room for him to move. And number two, the place where that you last got the word of God over your life. Maybe it was a message, maybe it was a word of wisdom, maybe it was a word of knowledge, maybe it was prophetic unction. I don't know about you, but I lose stuff. Like, I, I cannot keep up with my keys. It is a constant issue. In fact, every facility that we have associated with our church that has a door that I have to enter, they've had to put a key code on it because I can't ever find my keys. In fact, when I go to get into the vehicle, it is a common occurrence at our house that I cannot find my keys. So I know what it is to have to retrace my steps. And some of you feel like that you've lost something in your relationship with God, that, that maybe there's been some part of his, his promise in your life that, that it just doesn't feel like it's, it's, it's what, it, what, 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 he, what, he, what he promised you in your life, that some of you, you've had moments in your situation with God where it's like, well, God, I wouldn't even have had this thing if you hadn't told me I could have it. God, I didn't even ask you for this thing, but you told me I could have it. And now, God, it feels like nothing's working out the way that I thought it was going to work out. It feels like something is dying on me. And I believe the Lord would would say to you, retrace your steps and find that place where that you last made room for him. Find that place where you last set aside time to pray. Find that place where you last set aside days to fast. Find that place where you last got up every morning and said, I'm going to put myself in the word of God. Find, find, am I make, I'm going to have to get personal, ain't I? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, so our church went through this thing. Um, we were like growing like crazy. But while I was preaching, like I would look out and people would be making out their laundry list and clipping their fingernails and playing with their phones. And that bothered me. And so this was some time ago and my, my dad, he's just a man of really few words. He's the closest thing to Grizzly Adams I've ever met. <laughs> True story. He doesn't say a lot, but when he speaks. So my dad's always volunteered at the church. He, he's never had a job there, but we've created a little office for him. Like It's almost equivalent to the closet at one point. And at this particular time, he was in his little closet space, and I would come in on Mondays, and I would be so mad about the way that the church was going. I, I'm like, we're growing, but it's just, it just feels like there's something missing. 
You, you do understand that everything that grows isn't healthy. See, you can get cancer and it'll form a tumor and it'll grow faster than any other part of your body. And I, I would go in, I would stand next to my dad's little office door on Mondays and I would just start, can you believe those people, dad? I mean, they're playing on their phones while I'm trying to preach. Like, what has happened to church people? And my dad, finally, after several days of this, he was just tired of hearing. He just said to me, he said, Eric, you want to know what's really wrong with this church? So I think I've made that abundantly obvious. I would love to know. He said, Eric, you ain't anointed anymore. I said, who, what? And I started quoting my resume to him of everything I had give up to be in middle of nowhere, Kentucky. And all the sacrifices that I had made and all of the challenge. So I went to my office and grabbed what little bit of stuff I had and I went out and got in my truck and at that time we had a gravel parking lot and I just did figure eights all over the gravel parking lot <laughs> and I made sure to baptize his window in gravel. And I went home and I did something incredibly spiritual. I went into my basement and I watched the Godfather trilogy for three days. <laughs> and on the third day, I'm still brewing. And I come up out of the basement. And I walk by my little, sweet, meek wife who I found in a Baptist choir. And I, as I passed by her, I said, can you believe the audacity of my father that he would say something like that to me? She said, well, Eric, I have to admit, you're not the man you used to be. <laughs> see, see, see th 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 this time I went a different direction. I, I didn't go back to the basement. We, we had this room over our garage. I hadn't been there in a long time. It was called the prayer room. It was this place where we had made room for the move of God. And make sure we were synced up with it. Make sure we were in line with it. And, and I remember as I began to make my way up those steps, I wasn't even to the top of them by the time I was flat on my face. And I began to cry out to God in repentance and repent for the fact that I used to make the sacrifice, but I didn't make it anymore. That I used to be intentional about who my friends were, but I wasn't anymore. That I used to be making... And all of a sudden, as that repentance began to take place, God began to re just refresh me with every word that had ever been spoken over my life and every prophetic declaration that he'd ever given our household. And I'm telling you three days later, when I come out of that place, something was different than me that has never been the same since then. I believe God... I believe God's trying to get somebody to retrace their steps. He's trying to get you back to the place where you used to make room for him and you start making room for him again. And it's not just 21 days at the front end of a year, but you begin to live 24-7, 365, saying, I'm getting up serving God and I'm going to bed serving God. And with every step that I take, I'm going to put hell on the run, that hell might be plundered and heaven might be populated. And that when I go to bed at night, hell's going to know they had to deal with somebody that was consecrated to God with clean hands and a pure heart and a renewed mind, a helmet of salvation, a breastplate of righteousness, loins girded with truth, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, one hand the shield of faith, the other the sword of the spirit, weapons of the warfare, not carnal through man's hands, but mighty through, I don't know who I'm trying to help tonight. I'm talking about blessed coming and going, the head and not the tail, and every enemy that raises his hand against you would be smitten by the Lord your God because you've read the back of the book and you understand we win because our Lord's got eyes like fire and a sword proceeding out of his mouth and upon his back is a vesture that's dipped in blood. We understand that we are not called to blend in. We are called to stand out for such a time as this. We have been brought to the kingdom of heaven into our land and if we perish, we we perish for if God be for us who can be against us slap somebody a high five and tell them you better retrace your steps you better retrace your steps you better retrace your steps
There's something that happens once the the man of God who represents the move of God, once it gets into this house, he he, he makes his way into this room, this this place that was created long ago. And and when he walks in, I mean, Scripture says he does something wild. It, It says he finds the boy and he lays down on top of him and he stretches himself. Boy, doesn't that sound like God? I mean, every time God gets ready to do something, he requires somebody to stretch something. And the way you can really tell it's God in this story is a man didn't have to do it once. He had to do it twice. He stretches. Symbolic of what God's about to do in your life there. You're retracing your steps. and You think stretching once is enough. You're about to stretch again. Go ahead and get ready. And stretch, stretch. And then it's what happens next. It is unique, okay? It's almost like God's trying to get something metaphorically across to his people with prophetic unction. It says, the symbol of the move of God, Elisha, put his eyes on the boy's eyes. means you're about to get your vision back, your dream back. You'll perish without it. You'll wander aimlessly without it. But the vision came back. And then it says he put his hands on his hands. It means the power of God, the work of God, the work of ministry is coming back. But then he put his mouth on his mouth. It can mean a lot of things theologically. There's a ton of revelation just in that one unction. But know this. It means the word of God is coming into your mouth. That the enemy's not going to be able to silence it. He's not going to be able to prevent it. That, that, That God's not just bringing you back to life but he's bringing your vision back. He's bringing his power back and he's bringing his word back. And there ain't nothing that hell can do about it. And the way that it happened in this text is it says the body started waxing warm. You ought to tell somebody things are. Can't get no help on a Wednesday night. Come on, Mississippi. I could have got an amen in Kentucky there, I know. Come on, tell somebody. Things are heat. I'm going to invite them to come to, and play some music. And I, I, just, I just sense over so many of your lives that things are heating up. <laughs> there's, there's some of you that you, you, you've waxed cold in your relationship with God. A part of it's because it felt like some promises died. It, it felt like something w- wasn't alive that once was alive. But, you know, that's actually what the Bible talks about. Jesus prophesied that in the last days, the love of many will wax cold. Jesus said that. He said it will be one of the signs of the time that, 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 that people will wax cold. There's a waxing cold that has happened in our nation, that has happened even in the global church. If if you've noticed, it it, it seemed like at times that things were cooling off in some way, shape, form, or fashion. But I've noticed something over the last two years. Those that are heating up, they're heating up fast. Things are getting warm in a hurry. And I would go as far as to say that those that want to be hot are getting hot in a hurry. God is warming. He's war- God's presence is a consuming fire. And when his presence really starts to manifest, he'll heat up a worship service. He'll heat up a prayer meeting. He'll heat up a small group. He'll heat up a conversation. And you'll start to sense that his presence is burning. 
And I believe that you're going to have moments in Sunday services. You're going to have moments in Wednesday services. You're going to have moments in your small groups. And you're going to even have moments in your private prayer times with God where your family's just gathered around a coffee table. And it's just going to start to heat up. And you're going to begin to sense, man, I feel the presence of God. I sense the presence of God. There is a generation that is desperate for something more than a concert venue with a motivational speech that has a God slant. There is a generation that needs to know the power of the Holy Spirit and the fire of our God's presence. It is the only thing that will be the answer for America's problems. It is the only thing that will be the answer for a generation that desperately needs to be shaken to their core so that they can find an experience with God that cannot be explained away. I challenge you all over this room, would you just stand with me to your feet and I want you just to begin to praise God. I want you to worship God. I want you to thank Him for the fact that things are heating up. Thank Him that you're not waxing cold. Thank Him that you're not one of those folks that is allowing the sin to make you numb, that is allowing the lack of purity to cause you to slip into a slumber. But instead, maybe you're even now sensing, I'm more on fire than I've ever been before. That's a testimony of the presence of God in your life. Pray it over your family. Pray it over your kids. God, we believe that things are heating up. And I thank you, God, there's going to be people that will respond to the doorway. They'll come and they'll stand and they'll hear your prophetic word for their life. But there's others, God, they need their vision restored. There's others, God, they need the work of your power back in their hands. Somebody else, God, needs to be assured that you still speak through them, that you still decree the oracles of heaven through them. And God, I thank you that in the midst of it all, we are heating up that there will be revival fire unlike anything since the days of Whitfield and Finney. That there will be revival fire, God, unlike anything since the second great awakening in the United States of America. I thank you, God, that from Columbus, Mississippi to San Francisco, California to New York, New York, that God, you are going to heat things up for such a time as this. God, we worship you. We praise you. In Jesus' name.